calculations. According to my calculations. <laughs> Hi guys, my name is Joshua Wilson. I'm one of the gunsmiths here at Pro Shots, and today we're going to be doing a video all about night sights. We're not going to chase too many rabbits and cover every single brand and every single application, but really cover a lot of ground in the sense of just holistically, what are night sights, why do I or do I not want them, um, and what are the basics of how to put these on or how to get them put on. So one of the things we're going to start with covering is kind of the what's and why's of night sites and covering a lot of the questions we get asked on a routine basis. Um, one of the most common ones is what, so you mean like glow in the dark paint? Um, no, some people label sites as being night sites when they just have a little dished out section and a drop of essentially glow in the dark paint. Um, but that's not really what we're talking about. Night sites are tritium, gas encapsulated in a glass vial that is inserted into the site. So it is actually an irradiated gas. It's radioactive. It's just not on a level you have to worry about for health reasons. Um, but it emits its own light source. It's actually generating light instead of being something you have to charge up. So you can have true night sights in your holster, in your glove box, at your nightstand, whatever. Pull out of complete darkness and it will be glowing. Um, they have a half life of a little over 12 years. So that means that in 12 years it'll be half as bright as it is in the store or the day you buy it. Um, and in about 25 years, most manufacturers say it'll be about a quarter of a, as bright as it was when you first got them. Um, I've seen night sights of that age that are still serviceable, but ideally they'll be as bright as you can get them. Um, another common question we get is, well, what colors can I get in? Because people generally like having different color sights. But the catch with that is tritium emits light mostly in a green spectrum. So if you filter green light, you're not going to be getting a lot of light out of it. Uh, you'll see one of the most common is yellow because there's a good deal of yellow in green. So they will filter out um, down to the yellow and it will be a little less bright but still pretty serviceable. But if you use something like a red or an orange, it's really going to be pretty dim and also not going to last as long because it's not as bright to start with. Um, Trigicon, for example, warranties their sites for 12 years for the charge of the cells if they are green or yellow, but only five years for their orange um, cells. So just kind of give you an idea what you're getting into with that. Um, some of the examples of different night sight configurations or no night sight configurations and what you're going to be experiencing light to low light to no light will try to capture with the camera here in a little bit so you can kind of see what you're going to be getting into but some of the basics that we see the most of is the True Glow TFOs we put a ton of on so I'm definitely going to put these in here it's our most prevalent site that I have people have me put on we carry a, a lot of night sites in stock but this is what we do the most of these are green on greens so it's going to be equal brightness, but these also have a fiber optic rod. And the way fiber optics work, if you're not familiar, they basically capture existing light and channel into the rod. So it's using atmospheric light. And when that leaves, or rather really before it leaves, the tritium insert behind it picks up and starts channeling that light. So it's kind of the best of both. The yellow rear green front is what I like the best because the yellow is a little dimmer, slightly different color, so you're going to pick up on that front sight. When you draw the firearm out of a holster in low light, sometimes this and this can look really similar. So having that front sight be brighter or slightly different color will draw your eye to it and make you have a quick front sight focus. White painted sights is probably the most common thing you're getting on a pistol when you buy it. Um, does reflect some light because it's white, but as you'll see, does a little better than black in low light, but is in no way a night sight. Fiber optic sights. Great for target, great when you have existing light because it's going to be bright right now. It's channeling in the light of the room and it's going to adapt to your lighting environment as long as there's good lighting. 
When that leaves, you'll see that this leaves with it. And just straight night sights where it almost looks like just a little piece of glass in the back of each of them. Um, that's just straight tritium vial with an epoxy cover over it. Um, it'll generally be as bright or the brightest instead of because it's not being filtered in any way. But you know, versus you'll see versus the true glows, I can't really perceive a difference in brightness. I'm, I'm sure there is some to a degree. And then one of the things that I see a lot but I really don't recommend. I, I've used it with marginal success. It's better than nothing, but just using a tritium front sight. Um, what you'll find if you just have a tritium front sight and not tritium in the rear is I've got a point of reference and I can easily use that through my rear sight in good lighting, bad lighting, bad lighting. This starts to go away and then eventually all you have is a front sight. It's really hard to figure out where you're aiming if you know where your front sight is and you don't know the exact angle of the rest of the gun. So now that you've kind of seen the application of night sights as far as, you know, not really going to do you much good in the day in a target sense, but defensive, they're really par for the course because mischief generally happens in low to no light. So you've come to a point where, okay, I want these. Um, a lot of gun stores and gun shows and online resources will be happy to sell you night sights and people will have them and okay, well how do I put them on? Um, that can be the trick. Sometimes they go on easier than others and different guns have different systems. These are all different sight pushers for different pistols. Um, a lot of pistols there just is not a sight pusher made for it. There are some universal sight pushers. Um, each of these is representative of over $100, if I'm not mistaken. It's been a while since I bought one. Um, you can't always use them with all sights. So just because you have a sight pusher for a Glock or for a Smith & Wesson, you can get the factories off with that. does not necessarily mean the geometry of the pusher is going to work for your new sights. So there's also that that you could run into. Um, there is always the potential that you will have to file fit sights. You know, you've got a triangle that you're trying to push into a triangle cut, what is referred to as a dovetail in most cases. And a lot of times people will make those sights oversized, especially on things like 1911s, things where multiple manufacturers make the same thing. Glock's the only people to make Glocks, Smith & Wesson's the only people to make M&Ps. So if you're making sights for that, it's easier to figure out your margin of error, how big these sights need to be. Um, even then, there will be some tolerance differences. But with 1911s and things like that, it varies widely. So expect to have to do file fitting on 1911s. Um, dovetail files are what you're going to need. You can't really use standard files. Sometimes I'll use a barrette file uh, because you have to get up in that dovetail, um, whether you remove material from the slide or from the site. I was always taught in college to remove material from the cheaper part, so I always remove it off of the sites. But either way you're going, you're going to need something to be able to get up in there to actually get into that dovetail. And then sometimes, like especially with 1911s, once you get the sight fit, you'll realize there are some flat surfaces that you may also need clearance for. A lot of times on 1911s, that front sight, the actual blade of the sight has a cutout on the slide that allows it to set down flush. And some 1911s have a sight this short, some have ones longer and the cut and the slide might even not even go to the length of your sight. So there's a lot of potential hiccups in that. Um, it's really common for me to have people bring me slides and frames and sights where they have either tried to get the sights out and not been capable of it, tried to get them out, got them out, and found that there's mechanisms underneath them that they've messed up because a lot of times there's firing pin block safeties and different mechanisms in the slide, and if you take your sight off, there's springs and things under there that you can, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you can cause damage. Um, or they will, they will have damaged something in or out somewhere along the process. Um, having a set of the proper tools gets you a long way. Sometimes these don't work, whereas you're going old school. I've got some punches I've made. I've got some punches I've accumulated over the years. I've got a wall of punches in stock to where if I find something I can't, oh, I can make a punch and then I'll have it next time. Um, and then sometimes there's little specialty drivers, like for a PPQ, the side adjustment left and right, I made a bit for because I couldn't find anything that would really work that well. Glock style front sights have a specialty 
I mean, it is a size of that I'm sure you could find a socket for and grind it down small enough to work if you just had one to do. Um, but basically, for the fee of getting a set of sights put on, at most places, definitely with us, um, simply purchasing a file or purchasing a sight pusher or purchasing a punch that you might need um, is definitely going to make less sense than just having someone do it, um, monetarily speaking. Having a good set of vice jaws, these are uh, some I've made, I've bought a lot over the years, and I've never really liked them, so I've just slowly evolved into um, my own style of ones that I've made that I like. I've had been running these for probably five years, um, which is essentially cutting board with a leather backing and some stabilizer screws to keep them in place. But definitely something, don't wipe a, wrap a rag around a slide and try to put it in a safe. Um, you can maybe get away with that if you have flat jaws, but if you've got teeth in your jaws, it is going to definitely cause problems. That rag is not strong enough. Painter's tape, stuff like that. Something like leather um, is ideal. Wood can sometimes damage your finish. So essentially, in a nutshell, I definitely re recommend having someone put your sights on if you know you don't have the proper equipment to do it. If you got the proper equipment and you know how to do it or you have a buddy that can teach you or loan you the equipment, by all means get after it. If you get stuck, I can help you out. Um, but if you don't have at least some basic tools and understanding, um, it's definitely a good thing to do. If you, and one other thing on that note that I skip, I think, is it's not always removing material when you're getting sites. There's also the, quite often, where you'll go to put in a site and then realize this site is too small. I had to drive the old one out with a jackhammer, but now this new site, I can just push it through with my index finger. How am I going to press fit that? There's no tension screw. And in the front site, there's really no way to do that. Um, there's a few ways to go around it. A lot of times, staking the bottom of the site to increase the material fit and then using something like a locker for press fit parts. This will make up five thousandths on each angle and is temperature resistant, I think, to around four or five hundred degrees. It's been a while, but basically for the operating temperature of a pistol, you'll be fine on that. And that's Loctite 638. Great stuff. I mean, I've on things like our rental guns, I've had loose sights. I just put a little on there, cleaned off the excess. It's ideal to clean the dovetail and everything before you put it in. Um, but it works really well if you have one that's too loose. Um, staking, in addition to that, is more ideal. Um, and then also, there is the potential that you will have a buddy that has one of these sight pushers, and you have everything set up right, and you did nothing wrong. But on certain sites, they put them in really tight, like Springfield XDs is one of the worst, Smith & Wesson m ps is up there, but it can vary. Um, and the way these work is they push on the front sight blade, not in the dovetail when you're removing them. So what will happen is you have everything set up right and it's in there so tight it will shear off that front sight blade before the sight moves. Um, if it required that much force, short of it having some sort of a impurity of an, or an inclusion or a heat crack or something in the sight, it's going to be really hard to get that out without you know, machining it out, which I've had in the last, you know, few years, I've had three sets that way where I've actually put in sight pusher, had everything set up right, and it'll just shear the front sight blade right off of it, at which point I've got to drive all the way to Troy, which is the only place I have access to machining, and machine out my front sight so that I can then put in the new one. So that is one caveat that even if you do have the proper tools, there's all kinds of hiccups you can run into. But short of that, if you want to give it a try, by all means, if you need help or advice, give us a call, let us know. And if you want it done, we offer that as a service. Uh, a lot of times, it's something that we can do while you wait or while you're out on the range. So just give us a call and we'll get you set up.